What's going on, folks? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pit Podcast, your daily podcast covering the Pittsburgh Panthers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Nick Faraby. I write for Pittsburgh Sports Now, call games at WPTS Radio, and I'm a production assistant at ACC Network. And today we'll talk all about Tequan Underwood, the new Pitt wide receivers coach. It's official as well as passing game coordinator. We'll talk about that title, the significance of it, and what Underwood will be able to do for this team. We'll also talk about Pitt. They're almost near comeback against Virginia Tech at the Pete on Saturday. We'll talk about how to evaluate that and how this could affect the rest of the season moving forward. Also, Frank Signetti already recruiting quarterbacks. It's happening already. We'll talk about that here all on this episode in Locked on Pitt. Are Locked On Pit, your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Panthers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's going on, folks? Welcome back to the Locked On Pit Podcast, your daily podcast covering the Pittsburgh Panthers. And as always, thank you for making Locked On Pit your first listen every day, folks. Always appreciate that. And today we have a loaded episode. Lots happening in the world of Pit this weekend. Kenny Pickett lights it up at the Senior Bowl. We've talked enough about Kenny Pickett at the Senior Bowl to know where his stock and where he stands as it is right now. But listen, back at home, Pitt is making some rumblings and some noise as well as they officially named Taekwon Underwood their wide receivers and passing game coordinator did not expect the passing game coordinator part of that equation, but we will talk about that. The significance of it. But first today's episode is brought to you by bet online. Bet online has you covered the season with more props, odds and lines than ever before bet online where the game starts folks. Let's talk about Taekwon Underwood because this is a guy that really has kind of been a, a fast riser in the coaching ranks, right? And so very kind of a similar mold to a guy like Brennan Marion. Uh, although Marion had the offensive coordinator titles at, at Howard and William Mary that Underwood did not. But Underwood has essentially gone from not in coaching. He was an NFL vet for uh, about seven years there, and he played with a few teams. And so he's a guy that's been around the game and obviously has experience at the next level, which is always valuable when you're talking about that, an experienced guy at the next level that knows and sees what it has done. And he's been on winning teams. He's been on playoff teams. He's a guy that knows what culture is and he knows what breeds success. So that's always nice to have. And, you know, a guy that played for a, a guys like Bill Belichick, right? He played for Bill Belichick when he knows what, what they did in that type of locker room. You can breed success through that. You can take lessons from a culture like Belichick's and bring it to your own coaching career. And, and that's something Underwood has talked about before when he's talked about, you know, how he gets his players to work, how he gets his players to respect him, how he does all these different things. Like, that's a big part of it. Being able to work with a guy like Belichick, it gives you some sort of cred. And being able to, to do all these things and understand what a winning culture looks like, it gives you cred even though you're a new coach. And so Underwood went from the wide receivers coach at Lafayette to a quality control coach under Brian Flores, who is another great influence to have in terms of just understanding things there. Um, under Brian Flores, you get to understand different types of culture. You know, you get the Belichick part of it, but also Brian Flores has a very unique flavor to him, this different type of intensity that he brings that Belichick doesn't necessarily bring outwardly. And Flores is certainly more outwardly intense in that way and, and has a, a different type of style from Belichick, although he's comes from the Belichick tree, very different style there from really anyone else on the Belichick tree when you honestly look at that. Also, though, Going under a guy like Greg Schiano, who had been at Rutgers, had made them a wing program, you kind of understand different things there. And you also, through that and through these different stops you're making, you get different recruiting pipelines, you get different connections. And Underwood certainly has done all that, but a very fast riser through the ranks, you know, was out of the NFL. And all of a sudden, from 2018 to now 2022, he is now a passing and coordinator, wide receivers coach. A Power 5 school that had just won one of the Power 5 conferences in Pitt at the ACC Championships, and it's very well-deserved for Taekwon Underwood. It, you know, talking around about this guy, I, I mean, the, the impressive nature of what he has. And, you know, when I was down in Mobile, I got to talk to some people around ACC programs and Big Ten programs, and they were talking about 
you know, with me, you know, because I told him, you know, I covered Pitt and all this stuff. And, and we were able to talk about Tyquan Underwood. And he's a guy that's a very energetic recruiter. He gets after it on the recruiting trail. He's one of the better recruiters. He's a guy that specializes in places like New Jersey, uh, Florida. He has a lot of connections, too. He has New York connections. Um, he has some Virginia connections as well. So he certainly will hit all those areas. But it seems like Pitt is having a certain strategy now of maybe attacking New Jersey a little bit more, which is on the rise, to be fair. The Tidewater area, I know, I know this has been made a lot of kind of the buzz. You know, you need to attack the Tidewater area in Virginia, and Pitt could have gotten a guy with those Tidewater connections. But the Tidewater in recent years, if you look at the rankings, it's actually going the way of the Whippeal. You know, the Whippeal used to be this powerhouse pipeline, and it used to be a place where talent just grew on trees, essentially. And now, you know, it, it's a lot less so. It's, it still produces some decent players, but it's not something where you look and you say, that's a really target area. It's a priority area. Even for Pitt, where the hometown kids are growing, they don't send a lot of offers out to the Whippeal area anymore because there's just not a lot of talent there in the Whippeal area anymore. But the Tidewater is going the same way, where the, the rankings are slowly dipping and New Jersey is going up. So Pitt switching their strategy is going a little bit away from Tidewater. They're going to attack Maryland. They're going to attack New Jersey, maybe get into the New York area, certainly the eastern part of the state um, and, and PA. They're trying to get in that Philly or around Philly area, um, Bucks County, stuff like that. They're trying to get into that area. Underwood will also help there. He has some connections in that area as well. But this is a guy that has connections in a lot of good areas. Florida as well. That's always been a priority for Pat Narduzzi and his staff. Recruit Florida very hard. It's one of the richest talent pools out there in the country. And certainly Pitt has made that a statement that they really want to recruit that area. And Underwood's going to help them recruit that as well. And so Taekwon Underwood's a, a very good recruiter. Probably the second best recruiter that Rutgers had. So it, he, this is a loss for Rutgers um, in terms of that. But He's also a guy that has helped develop uh, receivers. Bo Melton, for example, who I just saw at the Senior Bowl, really developed under Tyquan Underwood, really blossomed. He credited Underwood with a lot of his development. So, you know, he's a guy that's also shown some, some coaching acumen. He's a guy that these guys love to play for. Just all, You don't even have to ask around for this, but it is true when you ask around for this too. But just look at some of the quotes that the Rutgers players say about their coach and, and what they say about Tyquan Underwood. They love playing with the guy, the respect – the love. He's almost like family. You know, he, he's a type of coach. He's a player's his coach, but he pushes them hard enough. And, and I think that's something that Pitt really wanted in a coach is, is, you know, similar to Brennan Marion. And, you know, Brennan Marion was very eccentrically players coach heavy. And, and he was a guy that supported them. But also Brennan Marion set these very hard things like the drop count. Um, If you get a drop, it'll be made a big deal of. Stuff like that. He had these very unique drills and, and all these. And Underwood kind of comes from the same way where he takes these ideas from coaches he's seen but meshes them with his own, uses his NFL experience he had. And now you have a coach that has kind of a unique style to him as well as really going through uh, a culture type of, of ideal. And, and he has all these ideas and he's coming together. And it's a big reason why Taekwon Underwood's gone like this up through the coaching ranks. I mean, I think it's a good hire for Pitt. I think they get a lot of the areas they really wanted to look for in their recruiting. And again, that that has been a big factor early on in this 2023 cycle is Pitt wants to attack that New Jersey area. It's a talent-rich area. There's a lot of schools in that area. But the Tidewater area is an area where, you, where you'll find Clemson. It's an area where you'll find Alabama. UNC in recent years has really, really come on and tried to attack that area as hard as anyone else. You still get Virginia Tech in there. Um, you get all these top schools in there. It's Notre Dame, Ohio State, they all come in there. But New Jersey's a little less, I guess, preoccupied. You know, Notre Dame's there and so is Rutgers. But it's it's not as crazy. You know, Pitt, there, there's voids to fill there. And, you know, Pitt found the void in a place like Florida, for example, where there's a lot of talented, high three-star kids that aren't going to get all the notoriety because a lot of these schools are targeting the higher-ranked kids. And Pitt recruits a lot of those players. Pitt found a lot of that in Maryland. Pitt found a lot of that in upstate New York now with guys like Addison Copeland. They find that sometimes in Ohio. 
Um, so Pitt has found these areas where their talent rich pools they can kind of come in and take advantage of. And I think they think New Jersey's one of those. And Underwood is a guy that has proven to recruit uh, at a high level. He's gotten four stars to come to Rutgers. You know, he's got a lot to sell at Pitt, certainly the ACC championship thing. So you're excited to see what Underwood can do with, with essentially what he has to sell here at Pitt, you know, between the Steelers, between the ACC champs, between the upward trajectory of the program, between, you know, the the high level offense that they've played over the past year. Um, there's like so much that he can sell with them and he, and in, including himself, which seems to be quite endearing um, to most recruits. Um, so Underwood's a guy that, that has so much at his disposal. So it's going to be really exciting to see what he can do because he's a type of coach that seems to, to at, on the surface and, and what, you know, Rutgers has said, he's kind of the best of both worlds. It gives you a lot of recruiting. He also gives you very good coaching. And I think that's what Pitt wanted. And, and Pitt's going to get a, a really solid coach here in Taekwon Underwood. The passing game coordinator part of that is interesting. It's probably what they needed to do to draw him away from Rutgers. That's his alma mater after all. And they also probably up the pay a lot, but the, the passing and coordinator title is is very interesting to note. You know, Pitt has never really had a passing game coordinator or a run game coordinator, if you will. This is a very new title for them, but it's probably a title to incentivize that those dollars to go up. So Pitt clearly wanted Tyquan Underwood badly, and then you know, Coach Narduzzi talked about that in his press release how he very he really endeared himself to the staff how they really love him, how much of it was the hair. <laughs> probably not a little, probably a lot of it, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. But, you know, the, the best, some say, as Tyquan Underwood says in his Twitter bio, some say the best hair in the ACC. And I don't know, Rashad Battle might have something to say with that. Um, but but Tyquan Underwood has been a guy that has essentially everything on his resume. Um, I know he's, I know he's a, in terms of coaches, he's very inexperienced. But in, in four years, to look at what he's done, to look at how respected he is around the coach community already, to look at the recruiting, to look at the results he's had with his players at Rutgers and, and the upward trajectory of, the, of those receivers, guys like Bo Melton there, uh, getting a senior bowl invite, he'll probably get drafted. Um, guys like that, and you look at, at how much endearment he's had towards the fan base of Rutgers, um, towards the coaches there. And basically, the recruiting process and the connections he has to certain areas, this is a really good hire for Pitt. They're going to get a, a lot of different kind of ideas coming from Rutgers, obviously, but this is going to be good for them. They have all the areas they want to attack, and, and Underwood's going to bring them that also a guy that can coach and coach up your receivers. And, hey, it's hard to pass up an opportunity to coach Jordan Addison, get more money, and get the passing coordinator's title. I think Pat Narduzzi gave him everything he probably wanted, and they land a really, really solid hire now in Taekwondo Underwood. I'm excited to see what the receivers do under Coach Underwood. All right, folks, we will talk a little bit about Pitt men's basketball now, how we evaluate the first half versus that unbelievable second half. We'll talk about it all. Pitt lost, but how do you evaluate it? We'll talk about that. But first, let me let you know about Bet online because for folks, bet online as you cover this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. As football continues to march through its playoffs, right to the big dance in a week. So, betonline.net remains your best spot for all the sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just football, bet online has up to the minute info on pro and college hoops, NHL, boxing, UFC, along with live real time updates of current games. So, don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available for the 2022 season. Bet online where the game starts. All right, folks, welcome back to the Locked On Pit Podcast here. Oh, and we got to talk about Pit Men's basketball. It's kind of, it, it, let's be honest, folks, and, and I think you and I both know it's become a little exhausting at this point, right? To talk about Pit Men's basketball. There's only so much I can say about this team. You know, I've said so much about them already. And and I say there's only so much I can say about them because really, I have said so much about them. This is a team that really doesn't have things completely set in order, right? This is a team that still continues to fight along the edges trying to find the, the identity they have. I, I think they... You know, I think they have an identity, but they need to find a shred of consistency. And to come out 
with a dud of a first half. This was the worst first half. I, I, I'm going to be real with you. I don't remember a bat, as bad of a first half as this one was. I mean, some of these some of these were absurd. These stats are, are unbelievable when you look at it. 13 of 13 to nearly close out the half. The only last missed shot was the last one put up. It was 13 of 14 and a half. They didn't miss a field goal from 12 of 17 to that last second buzzer shot. That's 12 minutes and 17 seconds of game time. You did not miss a shot. Listen, I don't have a specific stat on that, but I have to imagine that is one of the longest times without missing a shot in game time ever. I mean, that's absurd. I, I've never seen anything like that. They shot 75% from the field in the first half. They shot 78% from three-point range. Some of this was Virginia Tech just shooting out of their mind. But let's understand, all those three-pointers they took, they were wide open. Wide open. And so, while I get it, it was an unreal shooting night for Virginia Tech, and it was one of the best shooting displays I think I'll ever see. Um, I'm just not sure I'll ever see that again in the first half. I, I, you just don't see 13-13, to 13, not missing shots for 12 minutes. I, I mean, at some point, even those open shots can't go in, and that's kind of what happened in the second half. The whole luck thing reverted back the other way, and Pitt started not missing anything. At one point, it was 10 for 10, so it's a real game of streaks. But this was – such an odd game and, and Pitt's perimeter defense in the first half. I mean, wow. <laughs> it was terrible. It really was terrible. You know, Pitt got cooked by Storm Murphy all night. And he Mulaney was a guy that had a beautiful step back three and just embarrassed Pitt. I mean, everyone seemingly made a three pointer in that first half. It was everybody getting in. It was everybody getting in on the action. And you were wide open every time. Pitt had no answer for it. Pitt had no answer on the pick and roll. Pitt had no answer on the kickouts, on the quick ball movement. You know, they were playing a lot of man, and then they finally switched to zone. And the second half, a lot of things improved. It was incredible. But they got to have that same type of effort that they had in the second half through the entire first half. If they have that, they win probably. You know, I mean, I mean if they're down by – 20, they probably win the game, but down by almost 30 at halftime. I mean, when you get down by 27 and at one point in the second half, you were down by 29. How are you going to win the game? It's a, it's really a miracle that Pitt made this competitive. And they had an unbelievable second half. And Femi Odukali played out of his mind. Jamaris Burton played well. Mogi did what Mogi does. Onyeze Kuda had really nice contributions. But let's be real here. You just can't come out with that first half dud. And Pat Narduzzi, you know, not Pat Narduzzi, Jeff Capel talked about this, right? You just can't have that type of mentality. And you can't come out and look like that. And when John Hughley's not playing and when his head's down, the team can't feed off that energy. And that's something that Femi Cali talked about is that, you know, Hughley's kind of the, the positive ray of sunshine on the team. They need him to have better body language. And so there's things he's got to learn. But the team overall, it's too late in the season to have duds like this. It's too late in the season to be realizing, oh, my goodness, we are down by 29. We are down by 27 in halftime. Now we got to come back. You got to play with that same urgency from the very tip. And Pitt didn't. And that's why they lost this game. That was a very beatable Virginia Tech team. I think Pitt realizes that. We'll see what happens tonight, obviously. They're down in Blacksburg. But so it's a game Pitt could win. I'll say that. It's a game Pitt can win. But this was an absurd game. Only nine second chance opportunities for both teams combined. I mean, really, the rebounds weren't there. It was, when you look at the shooting percentages, both teams shot over 50% from the field and 50% from three. And yet the game was as low scoring as it was. It was only 76-71. The, the pace of play was just agonizingly slow. Both teams shot for less than 50 shots, which goes back to saying there were just not a lot of second-chance opportunities either. So this was an odd game on all fronts. But Pitt, just, you just can't do that in the first half. And Jeff Capel needs to bear the responsibility for it. 
And the fact that in the post-game presser, he said he didn't know why his team came out flat. That's even more of an indictment. You have to know that. That's your fault as the coach. Why is your team not in the headspace to play right away? You have to know that. And you have to know the solution for it. And if you do know the solution for it and you keep telling them and they're not hearing you, it's even worse. But understand this. Clearly, he hasn't lost the team because they're fighting hard. I mean, even after going down 27 and you, and you fight that hard in the second half, clearly that's not a coach that has lost the team. This is not a Chris Mack and Louisville situation where they're just not trying. Uh, they came out lackadaisically, but they woke up. And, and that was – Capel clearly said something at halftime. He said something to get the, the team's gears going again, and, and something was going. But you just can't go down that. In the first place, you have no recruits left. It's been sloppy last three games. It's been a really bad defensive effort. What do you want me to say to that? The future doesn't exactly look bright. You have about four ACC caliber players on the roster right now, and one of them is leaving. So what do you want me to say to that? Jeff Capel's going to be fighting for his job the rest of the year, and I'll tell you what, first halves like that do not help you. That was an embarrassing first half, just as equally as it was a fun second half, but the embarrassing first half, it absolutely overshadows that second half, regardless of how you want to look at it. So we'll see. But but Jeff Capel needs to continue to get this team back on track. They need to come back, and they need to bounce back and win this game at Black Swing. They need to come on the road and really pop them in the mouths and, and showcase some resiliency here. We'll see if they can do it. Folks, I do want to talk about Frank Signetti's quarterback recruiting here as he offers six quarterbacks over the weekend. But first, let me let you know about Built.com because, folks, this is the time of year that I'm guessing you've pretty much all given up on New Year's resolutions, but not this year. I'm telling you, you can stick to your resolution to eat right thanks to Built Bar. It's almost like it's really not a resolution because you can enjoy eating them. Have you tried the puffs? Because if you haven't, you're missing out on one of the best Built Bars there is. Puffs are the first ever protein-infused marshmallow. They're fluffy. They're marshmallow. They're not just a protein bar. They are a treat, and they're covered in 100% real chocolate. Puffs are a fan favorite with some incredible flavors. Yummy cinnamony churro. Coconut marshmallow, ban- banana cream pie, so good. These are so good, and they're going to be some of your favorites. And all Pith Bars are covered in 100% real chocolate. Yeah, puffs included 100% real chocolate. You get low calorie, high in protein, so you can replace your candy bars with all these healthy built bars. So all you have to do is go to built.com and scroll down to the macro short. You'll be blown away. It's all high protein and low cal, high fiber, low carb. You get it all with Built Bar, and you get all the different flavors. At the Built Bar, they're all about taste. They might taste delicious first, then you can figure out how to make it healthy, but they pull it off every time. So, folks, go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCK15, and get 15% off your order. Again, that's all you have to do. You use the promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. All right, folks, welcome back to the Locked On Pit Podcast here as we continue to talk a little bit about what happened at Pitt over the weekend. And in this one was interesting. You know, Frank Signetti, Pitt's new offensive coordinator, getting hot on the recruiting trail, if you will. He goes after six different quarterbacks, all from around the country, Pitt had not previously offered. And not in places you would expect Pitt to offer. Tennessee, Alabama, Kansas, Iowa, it's different when you're going all around the, the map to go find these quarterbacks, right? But it's very, very Frank Signetti-esque. Frank Signetti is a guy that is described as one of the most energetic recruiters that has ever been around Pitt, and that's going back to his first stint with Dave Wonstadt. He did the same thing here back then where he would go off for guys all around the country, recruit them, try to get them on visits, see what's serious, and then see what they do. Signetti is not Mark Whipple in that regard. Mark Whipple's a guy that did not recruit a ton. He's a guy that often would kind of just, I don't want to say lollygag around, but he wasn't a guy that was on the recruiting trail. He'd find maybe two quarterbacks, three quarterbacks, offer them, see what they got. And and if they he couldn't get them, you know, Narduzzi would step in or someone would step in and help him get those quarterbacks because he was not the dude getting all the quarterbacks. On the other hand, let's get Signetti going. This is a guy 
that's going to go after anyone and everyone he wants. And I mean that endearingly to a T. Frank Signetti is going to be one of the most energetic recruiters Pitt is going to have around as an offense coordinator. He's more energetic than Sean Watson. He's more energetic than Matt Canada. Those two guys would recruit, not like Frank Signetti. He's already offered six quarterbacks. Don't think it's the end either. That He's only gotten east of the Mississippi. There's a very good chance we could see guys from Arizona, Washington, California. Who knows? Could be a dude from Wyoming for all I know. Frank Signetti leaves no stone unturned. And, and that's what I love about Frank Signetti as a coach and as a recruiter. Is that he's a guy that 100% goes to find his guy. There is no stone unturned. And some of these guys are really highly rated. Like Vizini. Vizina from Birmingham. I believe I said that name right. You know, Chris Vizina from Birmingham, Alabama. This is a dude that has a ton of offers. Clemson's essentially courting him to commit right now. And yet Signetti wants to get him on campus. Like, sh- talk about shooting high. I mean, you're going after the ACC program right now. And he plays you do not have a pipeline. But, you know, Bo Edmondson is very interesting. Went to the same high school as Nate Yernell. Avery Johnson from Kansas. They got a lot of different players here to look at. And a lot of different guys they have ends with now that you can look at and be interested in, right? Because this is a pit team that needs to stock up that recruiting board a little bit with quarterbacks. Because here's the thing with Signetti. He's going to have to offer probably 10, 15 quarterbacks each class. Just realistically, some of those guys aren't going to pan out and have the season you want, which is okay. And maybe you have a few reach offers. Some of those guys are going to play outside of your offer zone because Pitt's not the blue blood that a team like Georgia is or Alabama. And some of those teams are knocking on some of these guys' doors. So you might not be able to compete with those guys. But there will be a few in that mid zone where you'll have maybe two or three very serious contenders that you can go after. It's a very sound recruiting strategy from Frank Signetti. He's done this at every stop. He knows what he's doing. You know, Frank Signetti has been around and knows what he's doing recruiting-wise. This has never been an issue with Frank Signetti. If you ever look at the issues he's had, it's always been on the field calling plays, kind of all of this minutia. But it's never, ever been the recruiting trail. Frank Signetti kind of knows what he's doing. So these are the first six. But I wouldn't expect them to be the last six. You know, who knows where they go next? West, north, south. Could go to Florida. Could go down to the Carolinas. But there's a lot of different offers going out to a lot of different areas. And they're trying to, to find the guys that are the best for them. And so... Recruiting like they are now on a national scale because of a guy like Frank Signetti who never leaves a stone unturned. Have to appreciate that. And this is the type of of energy you're going to see from Frank Signetti on the recruiting trail. And so get get used to it. The 2023 class is going to be a class where Pitt's going to full court press a lot of higher ranked kids trying to build off that ACC championship season. You know, they didn't get Jevin Williams. He committed to Penn State from the eastern part of the state. You felt like they had a chance with him, but couldn't get him, and I feel like there's going to be a few guys that are going to land like that. But I think also there's going to be guys that end up coming to Pitt and guys that Pitt in other years would not have gotten. They're going to land a few of these guys. And Frank Signetti's trying to make that happen at the quarterback position too. Expanding outside of your recruiting territory, your usual recruiting territory is never a bad thing. If you can find talent there that you think you can reach on and you can go get, always go into and Frank Signetti's the definition of a go-getter on the recruiting trail, very energetic recruiter. I think that's one of the reasons why Pat Narduzzi brought him on. He can help up the recruiting on the offensive side of the football. All right, folks, thanks for listening. Tomorrow we'll talk about Pitt versus Virginia and check part do. We will obviously see what happens there, and we'll talk either positively, negatively, or both. Who knows what could happen, but always thanks for listening to Locked on Pitt. And as always, folks, hail to Pitt.